Hi, I'm Dr. Barry Sears. Today, I'd like to give you an overview of the, probably one of the more exciting areas of biotechnology, metabolic engineering. What we're really talking about is understanding the molecular biology of wellness. This leads to the first question. What exactly is wellness? Well, a typical definition might be, if drugs treat the symptoms of chronic disease, then wellness must be the absence of the symptoms of chronic disease. That's not a very good definition because it doesn't take into account the fact that it often takes years, if not decades, for the symptoms of chronic disease to begin to manifest themselves. What you really want to know is the first point in your life that you're no longer well. So if these are not a good definition of wellness, what are some other definitions we might use? One might be, I'm just lucky. That's possible, but not a very good definition, especially for do, using science. Another definition of wellness might be, I have good genes. Again, that doesn't translate very well to others. But here's a third definition, the absence of insulin resistance. That becomes a medical definition of wellness that we can now translate and use now dietary interventions to maintain wellness as long as possible. So what exactly is insulin resistance? The simple story is your metabolism is not working. Now about 16% of normal weight individuals have severe insulin resistance. So you can't look at somebody and say a priori they have insulin resistance. But for most, the first physical indication that you have insulin resistance, you begin to increase the amount of abdominal fat. It's belly fat. And once you develop insulin resistance, this becomes a gateway to a wide variety of chronic diseases. So this being said, what is the primary cause of insulin resistance? The answer is a pro-inflammatory diet. Of course, this begs the next question, what is a pro-inflammatory diet? It's a diet that consists of one of these three factors. It might be deficient in certain nutrients, like omega-3 fatty acids or polyphenols. Or it might contain excess nutrients, like excess calories, excess high glycemic carbohydrates, things like sugar, bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes. Or it may contain too many omega-6 fatty acids or palmitic acid, the primary saturated fat. And finally, you could have an unbalanced ratio of protein to carbohydrate in the diet. Any one of these three factors can give rise to insulin resistance, but the more of these factors you have in your diet, the more likely you will develop insulin resistance. Now, this was our understanding of inflammation in the year 2004. This was a cover story from Time magazine talking about inflammation, talking about the secret killer the surprising link between inflammation, heart attack, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. So you would think from this article, all we had to do was to stop inflammation. It turns out that was too simple of thinking because you really need a zone of inflammation. If you have too little of an inflammatory response, you become a sitting target for microbes. Your physical injuries would never heal. But if your inflammatory response is too strong, then the inflammation is not resolved, that means being turned off, and the body begins to attack itself. So now our understanding of inflammation in the latter part of the 21st century says we have to keep it in a zone, not too high, but not too low. So how do we now keep inflammation in that zone? Because the reason we want to do that, because our current understanding of inflammation is we need some, but that does cause damage. However, the resolution, the turning off of inflammation is what causes healing. So it's really the balance of inflammation and resolution that's the key to maintaining wellness. So if inflammation causes damage, what controls healing? Well, actually, it's much more complicated than we're led to believe. Injury will cause acute inflammation. And certain hormones known as acosinoids or cytokines 
they begin to rise. They cause the pain, the swelling. Uh, the, this is the classic sign of inflammation. But as soon as inflammation begins to increase, you set in motion what I call the resolution response. These are b responses buried deep in your genes that are now meant to turn down and turn off inflammation. But now they're more complex. They require three separate stages. You have to reduce the inflammation. You have to resolve the inflammation, meaning turning it off. And then you have to repair the damage caused by the inflammation. And each of these three stages, if they're done in the correct sequence, they give rise to healing. Let me give you an example. Let's say you cut your hand. Initially, there's pain, swelling, redness. That's the acute inflammation. But if your body is working effectively, within a few days, the hand is healed completely, as if you turn back the hands of time. That's the resolution response. Now we can ask what this resolution response is in a little more detail. It's about healing, but it requires an on-demand resolution response to repair the damage caused by any type of inflammation. It's an orchestrated series of hormonal and epigenetic actions. But most importantly, each step of the resolution response can be blocked by insulin resistance. So this being said, how do you actually measure insulin resistance? There's actually a fairly simple blood test, a blood test that will tell you whether you have insulin resistance or not. The medical name known as homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance, which is called HOMA-IR. And to calculate this, you need two a blood tests. One, your fasting glucose, and the other, your fasting insulin. And once you have those two numbers, you put them in a simple equation, and out comes a number. If that number is less than one, you are well. You have no insulin resistance. Between one and two, that's what you might call normal. You're not sick, but you're not well. But once it goes beyond two, now basically the game begins to get more dangerous. Between two and two and a half, insulin resistance is now developing in every organ in your body. Between two and a half to three, you now have a significant insulin resistance. And if it's greater than three, you're in big trouble. And the reason why is because insulin resistance disrupts your metabolism, which leads to the question, what exactly is metabolism? Well, metabolism does convert food into energy. It also controls your immune system. It controls the expression of your genes via epigenetics. It controls your tissue regeneration. It controls your rate of aging. Anything that disrupts your metabolism will accelerate aging and accelerate development of chronic disease. Metabolism is incredibly complex. Think of this black box as one cell and you have 37 trillion cells in your body. And this metabolism in the cell controls your future. And you can see, say, what's going on? Well, the answer is a lot of things. This is called systems biology. Now, if you think metabolism is complex, the signaling systems that control metabolism are even more complex. Again, Think of this black box as your cell. And what you have are signaling mechanisms under metabolic control. They're telling basically different parts of your metabolism to turn on or turn off. And you say, this looks like a traffic jam in Naples on a you know, Saturday afternoon. How do we figure out how to control this? Well, it turns out the master switch, the master regulator of metabolism in every one of your 37 trillion cells is a molecule known as AMPK. And this particular molecule, enzyme actually, is under robust metabolic control. This means you can use your metabolism, you can use your diet to control your metabolism, to control basically the actions of every one of the 37 trillion cells in your body if you have the right dietary system. And if you do so, you increase your health span. 
And what's health span? Health span is simply longevity minus years of disability due to chronic disease. For most Americans, about 20% of our, life, our lifespan is spent in er, uh, having chronic disease, which drains all the joy out of living. Now, if you have insulin resistance, these are the primary complications that will happen. Think of this as a champagne fountain. Now, a champagne fountain at a wedding is a moment of joy. Everyone's happy. You add some champagne to the top, it fills up, and then it begins to spill down over and over to different tiers. And that's a pretty good analogy of what happens after you basically develop insulin resistance. The first tier starts to build up. You don't have any symptoms of chronic disease. You might be gaining a little body fat. You might be a little tired, but you're well by medical standards. But once that basically reaches a tipping point, you develop diabetes. And now your troubles really begin. Because once you have diabetes, you are four times more likely to develop heart disease and twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's. That's why many neurologists talk and discuss Alzheimer's as diabetes type 3. And now all roads that lead to insulin resistance actually lead through AMPK. 2,000 years ago, it said all roads lead to Rome. And likewise, in terms of your metabolism, all roads lead through AMPK. If AMPK is active, you are in control of your metabolism in each of your 37 trillion cells. On the other hand, if AMPK is inhibited, especially by your diet, your metabolism is going to go right into the sink, and you're now basically looking to develop chronic disease at an earlier and earlier age. So that is a backdrop. What is metabolic engineering? Well, what is engineering? It's basically fixing something that's broken. If your car is broken, you take it to a automotive engineer. He's called a mechanic. Likewise, if your metabolism is disrupted, how do you fix it? You take it to basically a metabolic engineer. But now that metabolic engineer is your diet. Because metabolic engineering allows you to reprogram your metabolism by activating AMPK in each of your 37 trillion cells. That's a powerful statement. No drug can do that. But your diet, if you use the drug, taking the right dose at the right time, can do that and can do it that on a lifetime basis. And there are three dietary components of metabolic engineering. There's no magic bullet. But think of this as a three-legged stool. Try sitting on a one-legged stool. It's impossible. You can't do it. Try sitting on a two-legged stool. It's incredibly precarious. But if you add a third leg to that stool, and all legs are equal length, then that stool is incredibly stable. And that's the goal of metabolic engineering, to make your metabolism incredibly stable so you can maintain wellness for as long as possible. And what are those three legs of metabolic engineering? One are omega-3 fatty acids, another are polyphenols, and the third is the zone diet. Each is important, each is critical, but you need all three legs to be operating simultaneously if you want to maintain wellness. And here's how the dietary activators of metabolic engineering work. The zone diet works by restricting calories, but restricting calories without hunger or fatigue. The polyphenols activate a group of uh, enzymes known as sirtuins, which are incredibly powerful to activate AMPK. And likewise, the omega-3 fatty acids, when they're made into hormones called resolvents, they also activate AMPK. So you have calorie restriction, polyphenols, and omega-3 fatty acids all working together to activate AMPK to maintain metabolic flow and uh, homeostasis in every one of your 37 trillion cells. So let's look at each one in a little more detail. Just exactly how do omega-3 fatty acids resolve inflammation? As with all things in, the, in met metabolism, it's complex. Because the omega-3 fatty acids are the building blocks of a group of powerful hormones only recently discovered 
called resolvents. These are the hormones that turn off inflammation. But if you don't have enough omega-3 fatty acids in the body or in the blood, you can't make resolvents. And if you can't make resolvents, you cannot turn off inflammation completely. And so these are really critical factors because these hormones are orders of magnitude more powerful than other hormones we're accustomed to hearing about. And here's the time course of inflammation. <clears throat> Initially, with the acute phase, the pain, the swelling, the redness, like basically having a bee sting you. And that basically activates now the immune system to basically come in and try to repair the damage. You get the flow of immune cells, like uh, neutrophils, coming in, and they cause destruction and even more pain. And they're followed by other immune cells called macrophages, which are more long-lasting, causing more destruction. But somehow, magically, those macrophages are turned from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. And what causes that transition? The presence of adequate levels of resolvents. Now, how do you know if basically you have enough of omega-3 fatty acids to allow the body to resolve inflammation? There's a simple blood test. It can be done by a finger stick to look at the ratio of two fatty acids in your blood. One is called arachidonic acid. This is the fatty acid, the building block of all of the pro-inflammatory hormones that cause inflammation, known as the costinoids. <coughs> the omega-3 fatty acid, eicosapentaenoic acid, is the building block of many of the hormones that turn off inflammation. You need some, but not too much. You need a balance. And the ratio of these two fatty acids in the blood will tell you whether or not you have the appropriate balance to be able to turn off inflammation. So exactly how much omega-3 fatty acids do you need to get the right balance? It depends. It depends how much inflammation you have and where it's located. Let's say you're well. You look good in a swimsuit. You have no chronic disease. How much of these omega-3 fatty acids will you need? About two and a half grams a day. Now, the average American consumes about 100 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids per day. That's not two and a half grams. But your great-grandmother knew exactly how much you need when she gave your grandmother a tablespoon of cod liver oil. Standard issue, no child could leave the house until they had a tablespoon of cod liver oil every day. That tablespoon contained about two and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids. But what if you're not so well? What if you're obese? You have diabetes or you have heart disease. You'll need more. Why? Because you have more inflammation. And what if you have chronic pain like rheumatoid arthritis? You'll need even more omega-3 fatty acids. And what if the inflammation now is located in the brain? You have multiple sclerosis. You have Alzheimer's. You have Parkinson's. You have depression. You have anxiety. You have ADHD. All of these will require even more omega-3 fatty acids. Make no the mistake, these are larger levels of omega-3 fatty acids, but they're also therapeutic levels. If you do not achieve these levels of omega-3 fatty acids on a daily basis, you will not have enough resolvents to turn off the inflammation in these various organs in your body. Now, those are guidelines, but testing is always better than guessing. Rather than guessing how much you need, test. That's why the finger stick test we developed over the years has been very effective in fine tuning to develop a personalized nutrition approach to say, how much do I need? Because each person is unique. But the level of the ratio of those two fatty acids will tell you how much you need and how much you need to maintain that to be able to basically make adequate levels of resolvents to turn off inflammation. Now, what about those polyphenols? Why are they important? They're important because they're activators of AMPK. Now, <clears throat> polyphenols, you find them in fruits and vegetables. But here's some problems with polyphenols. In fruits and vegetables, they're found only in very low concentrations. 
maybe two tenths of one percent of the weight of a fruit are polyphenols. And only maybe one tenth of one percent are, are found are polyphenols in vegetables. That's why your grandmother told you many years ago, you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. You need to eat a lot of vegetables to get enough polyphenols to activate AMPK. But even in those fruits and vegetables, they're not very well absorbed. Most of them do, are not absorbed by the blood. And if they are absorbed by the blood, they leave the blood very quickly. So you have a problem. To get enough polyphenols to activate AMPK, your master regulator of every cell in your body, you have to be eating lots of vegetables and some fruits all throughout the day to maintain adequate levels of the polyphenols in the blood. Now, there are 8,000 polyphenols. Which ones to use? Do you go to the GNC and just say, I'll buy everything you have? No. There are certain polyphenols which are far more bioavailable. The most bioavailable is one known coming from the maki berry. This particular polyphenol is the one that gives a highly degree of color. When you drink red wine and see the red color, what you're seeing are the levels of delphinidines, the, po the maki polyphenols found in the red wine. Now the, that says, well, obviously a solution. I'll just drink red wine. How much do I need to get enough polyphenols per day? The answer is about seven bottles of red wine. You can see there's a problem here. Drinking that amount of alcohol will probably have some negative health consequences. But you'll need to drink that amount to get adequate levels of these polyphenols that are water soluble and enter the blood. However, they can be concentrated to a very high concentration. So a single capsule would contain the same levels of delphinidines as the seven bottles of red wine. Now, if you can concentrate up these polyphenols, do they have any benefits? You don't ask studies in terms of animals, you ask studies in terms of humans. So you can look at now pre-diabetics because they're already be on the road becoming a diabetic. And they can measure this by a marker in the blood called glycosylated hemoglobin. And this is one study that's showing that taking a very small amount, a relatively small amount of these delphinidines, within a short period of time, dramatically lowered and statistically significantly lowered the levels of glycosylated hemoglobin because they're giving rise to better blood sugar control. And why? <clears throat> Because of the delphinidines activate AMPK, and what AMPK does once activated, it pulls excess blood glucose out of the sugar, out of the bloodstream. And what about oxidative stress? We hear a lot about this. But oxidative stress is basically free radicals being produced by the body, which are not basically being quenched. And so this is another study using maki at a higher concentration in smokers. Ask a smoker to stop smoking, it's not going to happen. So in this study, they took smokers, split them in two groups. One group got the uh, maki polyphenols, rich in delphinidines. The other group got a placebo. And within 30 days, you could see a striking, statistically significant reduction in oxidative stress in their body. Had they stopped smoking? No. But now the AMPK, being activated by the polyphenols, was able to now to basically orchestrate the release of antioxidative enzymes, which are orders of magnitude more powerful than antioxidants found in a health food store. And when they stop giving the, uh, the maki substrates, what happens? Basically, the levels of oxidative stress went right back up. Now, taking supplements is easy. Put supplement in the mouth, swallow, done. The last part of metabolic engineering is the most complex but the most important, it's the zone diet. Now the zone diet was not developed for weight loss. It was in fact patented to reduce insulin resistance. But the zone diet along with adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids and adequate levels of polyphenols such as rich in delphinidines is the key to pull it all together. Like I said earlier, taking supplements is easy. Changing dietary habits is incredibly hard. And why is this important? Because we talked about the dietary activators of AMPK, the omega-3 fatty acids, the polyphenols. But there are also dietary inhibitors of AMPK. 
Some are direct inhibitors, like taking in too many calories. Another one is taking in too much glucose. Both of these will inhibit the activity of AMPK, leading to insulin resistance and a, a, a wide range of chronic disease coming down the road. There are also indirect dietary inhibitors of AMPK. One is excess protein. Another is excess fructose. <clears throat> fructose is a simple sugar you find in fruits. And this is why you need all three of these working together for ultimate success. Think of adding supplements to your body as adding water to a big bucket that's full of holes. You can be adding the water, but those holes in the bucket well, basically the water will leave and all the benefits of the supplementation will be lost. The benefits of the zone diet, it plugs those holes up. So as you add now this dietary supplements, such as omega-3 fatty acids or polyphenols, then basically they begin to build up in the larger bucket. That's your body. And now they're all working together to lower insulin resistance. As I said earlier, the zone diet is not a diet to lose weight. It was patented as a drug, as a drug to reduce insulin resistance. And that's the power of the zone diet. And how the zone diet does that is by balancing protein to the glycemic load in your diet. This is no different than getting the maximum mileage from your car. You want your carburetor to be working at peak efficiency. You can't run your car all on gas and you can't run your car all on air. You need some combination for the best mileage. And that's what the zone diet does for your diet. It balances protein to the glycemic load to get the right balance to keep insulin in a zone. And by keeping insulin in a zone, that reduces insulin resistance. Now, what happens when you eat too many carbohydrates, like a high carbohydrate diet that's low in protein? you're taking in too much glucose. And what happens? Glucose, excess glucose, is an inhibitor of AMPK. And as you inhibit AMPK, you basically start to increase insulin resistance. Well, the obvious solution, go to the other extreme, a ketogenic diet, where you're taking in very little glucose and a lot of protein. But now you have deficient levels of glucose. And that's what the brain needs to keep going. And if the brain doesn't get enough glucose, it'll send a warning signal to the adrenal gland saying, start breaking down protein and converting it to glucose. And as the cortisol levels begin to increase in your blood, that increases insulin resistance. So between those two dietary extremes, too much carbohydrate or too much protein was a zone that allowed you to control insulin resistance on a consistent basis for a lifetime. So that being said, how do you start? Well, here's the easiest way to start. You want to consume 30 grams of low fat protein at every meal. If you only do that, you're well on your way toward the zone. And so what are the benefits of consuming that 30 grams of protein at each meal? One, you'll get increased appetite suppression. You're releasing satiety hormones from the gut that go directly to the brain to say, stop eating. And if the brain says, stop eating, you're not going to consume excess calories. You also are able to maintain your lean body mass. That's called muscle. Because you need protein to activate another gene transcription factor called mTOR. So this is what the benefits are of having 30 grams of protein, not more, not less, at every meal. You're never hungry and you maintain your lean body mass. Now, once you're able to master just getting 30 grams of protein at each meal, then you try to balance it with low glycemic load carbohydrates. Why? They reduce the insulin response to a meal. They also increase the release of short chain fatty acids from the gut that go to the brain to also facilitate appetite suppression. And finally, you add a dash of fat. What's a dash? A small amount. But it should be monounsaturated fat. It could be extra virgin olive oil. It could be almonds. It could be guacamole. But not much. And what you have it now is a drug, a powerful drug that can reduce insulin resistance. But like any drug, 
It only works when you use it. And you want to keep insulin resistance under control for your lifetime, which means you want to follow the zone diet for a lifetime. And that's the root word of diet. Diet doesn't mean a short-term period of hunger and deprivation to lose weight. It comes from the ancient Greek root, which means a way of life. So now in the 21st century, we can look at diet as a way of life of reducing insulin resistance. Now, if we add all this up, what do you get? For each meal, about 30 grams of low-fat protein. Not more, not less. About 40 grams of low-glycemic carbohydrates. About 12 grams of monounsaturated fat. This all adds up to less than 400 calories at each meal. But 400 calories that are adequate to maintain your muscle and adequate to stop hunger for the next five hours. Now, does it work in real life? One of the first tests of the zone diet was published in the 20th century, taking people who are either obese or type 2 diabetics. And at the start, you can see from their levels of HOMA IR, they were far from being well. The obese had insulin resistance, but the type 2 diabetics had far more. And they were put on the zone diet. And within four days, before they had lost any weight, you could already see dramatic reductions in the levels of insulin resistance. And even with extra weight loss by day 28, the insulin resistance was probably about the same as it was after four days. So it says in only four days, by following the zone diet, you can reduce insulin resistance dramatically. Great news. Here's the bad news. It only takes four days to have insulin resistance reappear. And this is why if your goal is to reduce insulin resistance, you need an integrated dietary approach. Remember, diet is a way of life. So an integrated way of life to keep insulin resistance under control, to keep it in the zone. And to do that, you need three dietary interventions to be practiced on a continual basis. Having adequate levels of intakes of polyphenols, ideally rich in delphinidines, Having adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids to make the hormones that turn off inflammation. And the zone diet that allows you to orchestrate insulin resistance. And if you do all three of those together, any one is good, but all three will get you in the zone. So how do we define the zone? We define the zone as the absence of insulin resistance. A medical definition. It's not some mystical state. It's saying, Either you don't have insulin resistance or you do. So like being pregnant, either you are or you aren't. If your HOMA IR is less than one, you have no insulin resistance. You have done everything in your power by the diet to basically live a longer and better life. So in summary, reducing insulin resistance is the key to fat loss, improved energy, and slowing down the aging process. It's metabolic engineering that can reprogram your metabolism in each of your 37 trillion cells to reduce insulin resistance and thereby increasing your wellness. And how do we define wellness? A blood test, the HOMA IR test. Wellness can be defined as being in the zone. And medically, being in the zone, meaning having a HOMA IR of less than one, which means you have no insulin resistance. Thank you very much.